M S W Media. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Friday, November 17th, 2023. Today, President Biden meets with Xi Jinping and reaches agreements on military communications and fentanyl. Israel seizes the Al Shiva Hospital in Gaza. George Santos says he will not seek re-election after the release of a scathing House ethics report. The man who attacked Paul Pelosi with a hammer in his home has been found guilty on both counts. Judge McAfee issued a protective order over discovery in the Fulton County racketeering case. A YouGov poll with over 12,000 interviews shows Democrats overwhelmingly approve of Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. And a new policy will prohibit Chicago police officers from joining hate groups. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Hey, Dana. Happy Friday. How are you? I am good. And I can't believe that last sentence is something we have to say of the intro, but we're going to get to that. But I am good. I'm we got through another week. You know, it's it's been a lot. I hope those listening are taking care of themselves and finding joy in each day. Uh, there's a lot there's a lot that we're trying to digest right now. There, there absolutely is. Uh, and we're going to talk. Uh, there's going to be a story from The New York Times about the Israel Hamas war. I just want to remind everyone, at least for me, and I, I don't you know, I think, Dana, you can probably say this, too. I am against the slaughter of innocent civilians. That's it. No matter where they are. Indeed, me too. And uh, I just wanted to make that clear. I am also anti Netanyahu and pro Israel and against anti Semitism and against Hamas, anti Palestinianism. I am against, no, I, you, if I'm against Hamas. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. Because there's so many. Yeah. There's so many. You can be for something. And for something else at the same time, it always no, doesn't have to be for like, I can say this and uh, without blowback, I don't particularly care for the government of Israel. I don't like Netanyahu. I know a lot of Israelis who live there do not like their government. It's the same thing that when we were living under the Trump regime, a lot of us didn't vote for him. A lot of us hated him. And unfortunately, he was the leader of this country. And so when he did something, it looked like a representation of all of its... Um, all of uh, us. All of us. And it wasn't. And so just keep that in mind. Yeah. And later in the show, I'm going to be talking to John Fugelsang about this, about Pastor Hagee, Hagee, who spoke at the Israeli march this past weekend, who's a renowned anti-Semite. And John Fugelsang says, you can be uh, pro-Israel and anti-Semitic. And so it's it's an interesting thing. There's, it's so complex. And, you know, I just wanted to put that out there, um, I, you know, because... It's so hard to, you know, I don't want to give a story and make you think that that's the only point of view that we have. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and also another guest that we have today. Do you remember, Dana, the protester that kept blowing a whistle when Peter Navarro was oh, trying to Oh, yes. I wanted to marry her just for a moment. Her name is Anarchy Princess on Twitter. And she is going to join me today because she went to the arraignment today of the man who was arrested and charged with um, misdemeanor sexual assault for putting that flagpole between her legs. While Good. She was doing, yes. So I'm going to have her on the phone from D.C. Um, so I'm looking forward to speaking to her. And this is some late breaking news. It didn't even make it into the headlines because it just now happened while we were talking. There will be no charges filed in special counsel Robert Hur's investigation into President Biden's handling of classified documents. So shocker. Yeah, as we predicted, I don't know why it took over a year to uh, to come up with that. Uh, I imagine him being like a pal of Rod Rosenstein. He'll probably put out some dumb report that we all have to read and that the Republicans will salivate over. Uh, and, you know, Donald Trump in every single filing in the Mar-a-Lago documents case from now on will cite probably things that um, come out of this, but no charges are going to be filed. So, no, and, and, you know, that's what we expected. So per usual, these days, we have so much news to cover. 
that we have a couple of quick hits. And to make a long story short, too late. First up, after deliberating for less than a day, a jury has found David DePap guilty on both counts in the violent attack on Paul Pelosi. DePap was convicted in federal court on one count of assault on the immediate family member of a federal official and the second count of attempted kidnapping of a federal official, namely Nancy Pelosi. He could face a maximum sentence of 30 years and 20 years on the charges, respectively. Thank you, A.G. And Judge McAfee has issued a protective order over discovery after the videos of the proffer sessions of Sidney Powell, Scott Hall, Ken Cheesebro, and Jenna Ellis were released to the press by the lawyer of a co-defendant, Misty Hampton. Now, this is in Fulton County racketeering case against Trump and his co-conspirators for trying to overturn the 2020 election. The media argue that we have a First Amendment right to information and discovery, like those tapes, but the judge reminds us that not everything turned over in discovery makes it into trial, and if potential jurors see these things that aren't as admissible into evidence, it could unduly prejudice them against the defendants. Yeah, that's such an important point. Uh, you know, I, I want to see these tapes. Everybody wants to see these tapes. The, the block on the release of these tapes is not forever. Um, and so um, the judge said, look, we can't, you know, there's there's stuff in, in discovery all the time. And then you get your motions in lemonade and there's a lot of stuff that is inadmissible as evidence. And if, you know, jurors see that they could they could be prejudiced against the defendants. And then you don't then you could get your shit turned over convictions overturned and you don't want that. Yep. And next up, you know how I feel about polls. But this one had over 12000 respondents that were interviewed from YouGov. And the poll found that 62 percent of Democrats approve of Biden's handling of the Israel Hamas war and that support for Biden among 18 to 29 year olds is the highest of any age group. Now, In this poll, there is no evidence of a backlash among Democrats and young people for Biden, though I'm sure we won't see these results uh, of this particular poll reported on mainstream media. But there it is. There it is. And this last story, there's a little bit of a trigger warning and I'm going to read it. But I think it's necessary. An ex post, uh, formerly Twitter, Wednesday afternoon referenced, and I quote, hordes of minorities flooding Western countries, a popular anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, by the way. In response, Musk, piece of shit, said, and I quote, you have said the actual truth. The anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that Jews want to bring undocumented minority populations into Western countries to reduce white majorities in those nations has been espoused by online hate groups and echoed by Robert Bowers, and he's the convicted killer of 11 worshipers at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018. And that was the deadliest attack against Jews in American history. IBM has pulled its global advertising from Twitter following a report that the social media platform ran the tech company's adverts alongside pro-Nazi material in a fresh blow to the company's efforts to bring back sales revenues. The move sent Tesla and Twitter stock reeling, and Elon Musk is no longer an Apex CEO speaker after his controversial comments. Controversial. They're hateful. Yeah. They're anti-Semitic, and they're hateful. They're not controversial. Anti-Semitism should not be fucking controversial. Right? That's a from New York Times. That should be a t-shirt. And I hope <laughs> that there's more backlash for this, especially uh, hoping the New York Times pulls Musk from their deal book summit which is scheduled to go on uh, on November 29th. We'll keep you posted on more backlash. All right, those are the uh, quick hits. It's time for more news. Let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right, first up from the Washington Post, House investigators found substantive evidence that Rep. George Santos knowingly violated a litany of ethics guidelines, House rules, and criminal laws. That's according to the House Ethics Committee report released Thursday that prompted Santos to declare he's not going to seek re-election next year. The report detailed a sweeping array of alleged misconduct that included Santos stealing money from his campaign, deceiving donors about how contributions would be used, creating fictitious loans, and engaging in fraudulent business dealings. Santos, the report alleged, repeatedly used funds intended for his campaign for personal enrichment, including spa charges and paying down his own credit card bills. Quote, Representative Santos's conduct warrants public condemnation. It's beneath the dignity of the office and has brought severe discredit upon the House. That is Rep. Michael Guest, a Republican from Mississippi, and Susan Wilde, a Democrat from Pennsylvania. Those are the committee's chairman and senior Democrat. And, then, and that was said in a joint statement. Santos railed against the Ethics Committee Thursday in a lengthy post on X, Twitter, which he called the report uh, a disgusting politicized smear and claimed he was being stoned by those who have flaws themselves. He added he would not be seeking re-election to a second term, after all. 
reversing course from a previous announcement in April that he would. According to the report, Santos was given an opportunity to submit to investigators a signed written statement responding to the allegations, but he didn't do so. Santos also did not respond to the committee's request for documents to voluntarily testify or to provide a statement under oath. Investigators noted they believed any testimony from Santos, quote, would have low evidentiary value given his admitted practice of embellishment, <laughs> unquote. That's a nice way to put it. The long-awaited report lays out the conclusions of the committee's months-long investigation in scathing language. According to the committee, investigators compiled more than 170,000 pages of documents and testimony from dozens of witnesses, including financial statements, to reach its conclusions. And here's a quote. Representative Santos sought to fraudulently exploit every aspect of his House candidacy for his own personal financial profit. He blatantly stole from his campaign. He deceived donors into providing what they thought were contributions to his campaign, but were in fact payments for his personal benefit. It continues. He reported fictitious loans to his political committees to induce donors and party committees to make further contributions and then diverted more campaign money to himself as purported repayments of those fictitious loans. He used his connections to high-value donors and other political campaigns to obtain additional funds for himself through fraudulent or otherwise questionable business dealings. And he sustained all of this through a constant series of lies to his constituents, donors, and staff about his background and experience. Some of the more egregious findings were centered on a consulting company called Redstone that was founded by Santos under the guise of being an outside group helping Santos's election campaign. So he created a company that pretended was not his, that was his, that supported himself. However, Redstone was not registered with the FEC, and documents showed thousands of dollars from Redstone were transferred to one of Santos's personal checking accounts. The funds were used, among other things, to pay down his personal credit card bills, and to make a $4,127.80 purchase at luxury brand Hermes, and to make smaller purchases on OnlyFans. Investigators also zeroed in on several expenditures that were paid with campaign funds that could not be verified as having a campaign nexus. Those expenditures included $1,500 and $1,400 on Santos's campaign debit card at different spas, both noted as Botox in expense spreadsheets. How many <laughs> fucking units of Botox are you getting at $12 a unit to run up a $1,500 bill? I mean, I mean, okay, just saying. Guest is the representative. Uh, he will file a motion to expel Santos on Friday morning. That's according to a person familiar with the plans. The House can consider the motion upon its return from holiday break on November 28th. By filing the expulsion motion himself, Guest adds credibility to the resolution after lawmakers were hesitant about voting to expel Santos earlier this month when the question was brought forth by fellow New York Republicans. Almost 200 Republicans and 31 Democrats voted against expelling Santos in fear that it would establish a precedent to oust lawmakers without receiving due process. After the reports released Thursday, several lawmakers who voted against expelling Santos earlier this month said they would now vote to expel him. It's still an uphill climb. They need they need um, two thirds members. It's still just gross. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. uh, I do hope that there's a Democrat in that area that will run because that seat is flippable. It is. All right. I just can't get over the $1,500 Botox. Thing. <laughs> like my old ass gets like 58 units. What is he doing? What is he? Oh, even... my God. I don't understand. You see how much Botox they use to freeze his assets. That's what I'm about to see. OK, <laughs> this is from Reuters. U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese leader Xi Jinping agreed on Wednesday to open a presidential hotline, resume military to military communications and work to curb fentanyl production. Thank God. Showing tangible progress in their first face to face talks in a year. Biden and Xi met for about four hours on the outskirts of San Francisco to discuss issues that makes me laugh, the outskirts of San Francisco, to discuss issues that have strained U.S.-Chinese relations. Simmering differences remain, uh, particularly over Taiwan. Now, in a significant breakthrough, the two governments plan to resume military contacts that China severed after then House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan in August of 2022. Biden said we're back to direct, open, clear, direct communication on a direct basis. That's quite the quote. Listen, I love my president, but that's quite the quote. It's a lot of directs. Lots of directs. In addition, Biden said he and she agreed to, meaning that other... <laughs> he said, she said. <laughs> he said, she said, uh, agreed to high-level communications. And uh, quote, he and I agreed that each one of us can pick up the phone, call directly, and will be heard immediately. 
Now, Biden and Xi agreed China would stem the export of items related to the production of the opioid fentanyl, a leading cause of drug overdoses in the United States. He says it's going to save lives. That was Biden adding he appreciated Xi's commitment on the issue. Under the agreement, China will go directly after specific chemical companies that make fentanyl precursors. And this is from a senior official. That's what they told reporters. He vowed to, and I quote, trust but verify Chinese actions on the drug. Ugh. I sure hope they do the right thing. The two leaders also agree to get experts together to discuss the risks of artificial intelligence. And a Chinese president, she signaled that China will send new pandas to the United States, calling them envoys of friendship between the Chinese and American peoples. I'll take one of those. And this is the quote, we are ready to continue our cooperation with the United States on panda conservation and do our best to meet the wishes of the Californians so as to deepen the friendly ties between our two peoples. That's what she said Wednesday during a dinner speech with business leaders. Bring on the pandas. They're the cutest damn things. That's what she said. They're just a bunch of... <laughs> Stop it. They're just a bunch of drunk humans in panda costumes. Uh, they're adorable. Um, the thing that uh, that's is kind of missing. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that's kind of missing, though, is um, the human rights violations. Uh, oh, yeah, there's this. that. But um, incredible progress on uh, reestablishing military to military communications. That's so important. And as is the fentanyl. And who doesn't love more pandas? Uh, but oh. um, I wish we would have. Uh, and, and you know what? There might have been behind the closed doors pressure and talks about that that aren't in the public readout um, for whatever reason. It could be. I do believe that pandas should be the peace offering in any conflict. That's not a bad idea. Thank you. Yeah. I might accidentally start a war if someone's going to offer me pandas to stop, just so you know. <laughs> I like red pandas. Okay. Oh, my God. They're cute. I know. They put their arms up when they're scared. Oh. Yeah. They're like. <gasps> yeah. And then too. they try to scare people with their arms. Oh. Yeah. They're, they're just the so adorable. All right. We digress. We do. All right. This is the story I was talking about um, in with the Israel-Hamas war. It is from the New York Times. I'm reading from the New York Times here. Israeli soldiers on Wednesday morning stormed that hospital, Al-Shifa, searching its corridors and rooms for evidence to support Israel's assertion that the sprawling medical complex doubles as a secret military command center. Over the course of the day, they hunted for weapons and interrogated those they found inside, according to both Israeli officials and Palestinians at the hospital. The early morning raid was seen by both sides as a watershed moment in the conflict, capable of shaping the pace and extent of the war. That's how big a deal this is. Israel says Al-Shifa, a sprawling complex in Gaza City, conceals an underground military base and has presented its capture as a key metric of Israeli success. Now, the Israelis also say that Hamas's use of the hospital highlights how the group defends itself with human shields. Biden called it a war crime. Uh, Hamas and the hospital's leadership have denied the Israeli assertions. Al-Shifa, they say, is nothing other than a medical center and sanctuary for thousands of people uprooted by Israel's strikes on Gaza. For Palestinians, the Israeli military's focus on a major hospital, when such facilities are typically off limits during times of war, is proof of its disregard for Palestinian life. What Israel finds there, or what they don't find in the hospital, could affect international sentiment about the invasion and influence the negotiations taking place on freeing more than 200 hostages being held by Hamas. 18 hours after the raid on the hospital began, the Israeli military released photos and video that said it that backed its assertions that it was being used as a as a cell like a, a terrorist cell for Hamas. It distributed images of 13 guns that it said its soldiers had discovered in the hospital, as well as a statement saying that it found a military command center in the hospital's MRI unit. In a video taken at the hospital, a military spokesman, Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricus, displayed caches of guns, ammunition, protective vests, and Hamas military uniforms. Some of which he said had been hidden behind MRI machines and others in nearby storage units. Again, this is the uh, Israeli Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Kornigus. He's uh, in the IDF. The New York Times was unable to verify the, the provenance of the weapons and equipment in the images or assess the claim of the command center's existence. Apart from a gunfight outside the hospital at the start of the raid, there were no reports of clashes with Hamas gunmen at the site. In a statement, Hamas dismissed the Israeli account as fabricated, a fabricated story that no one would believe, unquote. Should the Israelis, in the end, be unable to come up with compelling evidence that the hospital was used to house troops, store weapons, and command fighters, 
they may find that the time left to achieve their stated goal removing hamas from power will have been curtailed israel's targeting of al-shifa has already drawn global concern a failure to prove the raids necessity could make israel's international partners less supportive of further israeli operations in gaza a spokesman for the u.s national security council that's john kirby he was rejecting hamas claims that the united states had given the raid the green light and he said wednesday that israel had not alerted the white house ahead of time so hamas is saying that the united states gave the thumbs up to this raid on the hospital and the u.s is saying no no we didn't and we weren't told about it president biden said unequivocally that hamas does have a terrorist cell under and around the hospital during remarks to the press last night so we will keep an eye on this reporting again it's very difficult for reporters on the ground in Tel Aviv and elsewhere to get correct information because the phone lines across Gaza are down, so they cannot call to their folks embedded in, in the region. Thank you so much, A.G. These stories are hard, but we are going to keep bringing them to you. All right. This one I can't even believe is a fucking story. This is just insane. But the CBS, this is from CBS News, a new policy. Apparently, this is a new policy. I don't know why this policy didn't already exist. This is a new policy that was approved by the city's civilian police oversight agency that's going to ban Chicago police officers from participating in hate and extremist groups. Hmm. This needs to be said, apparently. The Community Commission for Public Safety and Accountability, otherwise CCPSA, they unanimously, thank God, approved the new policy on Monday. The Chicago Police Department now has 60 days to respond to the policy before it officially goes into effect. CBS2 has reported in the past on allegations of Chicago police officers participating in right-wing anti-government extremist groups like the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys. CPD general orders already prohibit officers from membership in or affiliation with criminal organizations and from association with known members of criminal organizations. OK, well, the change would widen the net to preclude members and participants in criminal groups from becoming members of CPD. It would add biased organizations to the list as well. Now, such biased groups would include any organization that, and I quote, advocates for systemic illegal prejudice, oppression or discrimination, including disparate treatment uh, against any individual or group on the basis of any protected class under federal, state or local law, including race, color, sex, gender identity, age, religion, disability, national origin, ancestry, sexual orientation, marital status, parental status, military status, source of income, credit history, criminal record, or criminal history. Now, it would also include any group that, and I quote, commits or advocates for acts of unlawful force or violence to deny others their rights under the Constitution of the United States or the state of Illinois, or to achieve goals that are political, religious, discriminatory, or ideological in nature, or commits or advocates for acts of terrorism or others' activities which seek to overthrow, destroy, or alter the form of government of the United States by unconstitutional means, end quote. So this, like I said, I can't believe this has not already been a thing. <laughs> the policy also reminds officers that they're prohibited from using social media to post content that's disparaging to a person or group based on race, color, sex, gender identity, age, religion, disability, national origin, ancestry, sexual orientation, marital status, parental status, military status, source of income, credit history, criminal record, criminal history, or any other protected class. That would include liking, following, sharing, or otherwise redistributing such content with the intent to promote, support, or otherwise endorse a criminal or biased organization or its activities. Hmm. Cities like Washington, D.C., Dallas, and New York, they have similar policies on the books. Now, what set the change in motion was the case of CPD Officer Robert Baker, who the city's inspectors general said was associated with leaders of the Proud Boys, which the FBI labeled as an anti-Semitic white supremacy organization. Internal Affairs was aware of the case, and he was given a 120-day suspension, but he remains on the force. The policy change would likely spell the end of his CPD career. Oh, I would be fine with that. The CCPSA says it will monitor how the policy is implemented. Mayor Brandon Johnson has the power to veto the policy, but the mayor campaigned on a promise to fire officers associated with extremist hate groups. So an unlikely veto could be overridden by the city council. Excellent. 60 days to respond. It'll be interesting to see if they say, we don't want to have to not join our hate groups. I know, right? What are you going to say to that? 
I would also be interested to see how many um, police officers resign or are removed from the uh, force. Yeah, once that this, might that might be a chilling number, actually. Once this goes into effect. All right, we'll be right back with Anarchy Princess from Twitter. She'll be joining us by phone from the mall at DC, followed by John Fugelsang for Fugelsang Fridays. And of course, the good news. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody, welcome back. So remember that time when Pete Navarro was outside the Prettyman Courthouse in DC and a wonderful, amazing protester kept blowing a whistle every time he was trying to give his fundraising website or complain about what had just happened to him in court. And this, of course, is for his contempt charge. He's, you know, going, he's been trying to fight that forever. Well, that uh, amazing woman was assaulted by a guy who goes by Jericho Steve, out, allegedly assaulted, out, outside of the courthouse. And uh, joining me today to talk about his arraignment today for being arrested is she goes by Anarchy Princess on Twitter. Hi. Hi, how are you? It's good to talk to you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure to be here. <laughs> yeah, I know we ran into each other at the Vote Vets like get together and it was really great to meet you. And I wanted to talk to you today. By the way, she goes by at Satire AP on Twitter. And I wanted to talk to you today about finally this guy was arrested and arraigned. Talk about what happened. Finally, like two months later. Um, well, he, it turns out he had a warrant since 921 and he was in Pennsylvania. So when he showed back up in DC, he'd been here for like two or three days, but uh, last night he finally got arrested. So backstory, what happened, uh, you know, I had been showing Navarro a few times and the third time that Navarro showed up in court, his security came that day. And then he also had a staffer, this woman, Joanna, and someone from OAN, you know, that like right wing news source or whatever. Um, and they all seemed to be conspiring to keep me away. Uh, and they were having conversations with Jericho, Steve, and this other guy who's actually an insurrectionist. He's the yellow sizzler for the sedition hunters. Um, and I knew them from Freedom Corner, which is where the traders, Ashley Babbitt's mom hangs out. Um, so I saw them all like having conversations and conspiring to keep me away from Navarro. So I filmed some things, you know, I made some comments to them. Um, and this is now the third time I'm seeing Navarro. Navarro comes out. Jericho Steve, who is known to assault counter protesters with this flagpole. He always has this flagpole. He's assaulted me with it before in front of the Supreme Court. Um, he's assaulted another counter protester. He was making threats to assault this other counter protester, this whistle guy. So anyway, I already knew he was going to be an issue. Uh, so Navarro comes out. Everyone's trying to block me. Jericho Steve shoves me. He like pins me against the cement block. Um, I like talk smack to him and move away navarro gets irritated because i'm still like in his face like he can't keep me away <laughs> even though there's like 10 people right so he goes back inside there a few minutes goes by navarro comes back out and again everyone's trying to keep me out of the way so i see a little a little opening a little space and i weasel my way in there and jericho steve is right behind me and he has that big flagpole and he like sizes me up. He's behind me um, and takes the flagpole and shoves it. The police document says in between my buttocks and groin area. So he, he, he did penetrate me with this flagpole. Um, and so I immediately, you know, I'm like, you know, yelling, like, what the hell? He just shoved this flagpole in between my legs. And Navarro turns around. Navarro's right in front of me. And Navarro's face is like, like, shock. Like, he's like, oh my God, like, I, I messed up. Right. So, um, I, I end up, it ends up being park police jurisdiction because there's a, uh, John Marshall Park is right outside of the courthouse where Navarro was having a little press conference. So I file charges with park police few days go by um and they roll up on jericho steve while he's at freedom corner and he refuses to identify himself but they notice the flag the flag pole um so they confiscate it as evidence and 
they come and they get some more information from me. I give them videos. So that was 9.13 that that happened. And then I hear nothing. And so I'm thinking, just like in D.C., where, you know, you get arrested and it's like catch and release. I assumed that would happen. Um, and so anyway, Jericho had been in Pennsylvania. He even cut his hair. He cut his hair, showed up at Freedom Corner one more time after he assaulted me. And then he left town because he's from Pennsylvania, went back home like kept going live and making all these excuses like, oh, my truck is broke down. Oh, I miss my family, blah, blah, blah. And then one day he just like three days ago snuck back into D.C. I was actually in Texas, so he didn't show back up in D.C. until I was, you know, on the halfway across the country. So last night, yesterday I got back and he showed up at the corner. And so I called the investigator I got their voicemail. I left a message. I did not get a response back. I didn't expect anything. And within 30 minutes later, Park Police rolled up. They arrested him uh, at Freedom Corner on live stream. So it was perfect. So everyone got to see it. Um, Jericho was like, freedom! Like, you can't do this. Like, fucking Nicole Raffitt was yelling, freedom! And Ashley Babbitt's mom was like, oh, yeah, you're doing big things, Jericho. So... Unlike every other time they assault me and get arrested, he was not released in two hours uh, because it was through the park police. So he was held overnight. Uh, this morning, he was supposed to be arraigned at 930. It was pushed back to 130. I was there. Um, all his little, little traitor friends were also there. He was charged. It's the misdemeanor, but it is sexual abuse. Um, so uh, he has a sexual abuse misdemeanor. He was issued a keep away order he has to stay away from me and he has to report to free trial via the phone once a week with his address so he was released on personal recognizance it was about four o'clock by the time i left and last i knew they were still waiting to pick him up and then he'll probably be down at freedom corner but december 12th he has to report back to court and he was pleading not guilty so um he's gonna have to argue why he used that flag to jab me i guess <laughs> so if he's convicted of this misdemeanor for sexual abuse does he have to register as a sex offender like what's the punishment here so i'm not sure about the sex offender i looked up mis so you know there's a bunch of different sexual abuse charges in dc but misdemeanor sexual abuse is um you know, whoever engages in a sexual act or sexual contact with another person who should have knowledge or reason to know that the act was committed without that person's permission shall be in prison for not more than 180 days and in addition, in addition may be fined an amount not more than the amount set forth in blah, 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 and it lists the code. So he, I, if this is, you know, because it's just with sexual abuse is what they said, and it's a misdemeanor, I'm assuming it's this, um, could be 100 day, 180 days, but I do not know about the offender registry. Yeah, and I wonder if he's got any priors as well, because I think that that would probably make a difference as to what his sentencing would be were he convicted. So, well, he does act, he does actually, because like I said, he's from Pennsylvania and he's originally from Washington State. Uh, and so, you know, he does a live stream, right? So he just babbles all the time. And he's made comments about how he hates Pennsylvania because of some charges that he has that are misdemeanors in Washington, but felonies in Pennsylvania. So therefore he's not allowed to own guns in Pennsylvania. Mm. Well, that might have an yeah. impact then. We yeah. will uh, keep an eye on it. And I hope in the meantime, everybody follows you at Satire AP on, on Twitter. I don't call it X. It's still Twitter. Uh, Me too. And uh, <laughs> I'm very glad that you filed charges. People shouldn't be able to do that shit. So thank you. Uh, thank you for doing that. And thanks again for your, you know, your protests against Pete Navarro and, and folks like him. I appreciate it. Yes, I appreciate you. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for talking about this. And, you know, like I said, this guy had assaulted me with the poll before someone else. He hangs out with the group that is constantly assaulting us and they continue to get away with it. And this time it was sexual abuse. And I mean, it was on C-SPAN. You know, everyone saw it and their their violence just continues to escalate. And so I'm glad that this hopefully will start to end that.
So yeah. thank you. Thanks for standing up for what's right. We appreciate you joining us uh, from, I think, the mall by phone today. So yes, uh, I, I, <laughs> I appreciate my little, that. My little, my little favorite secret garden on the mall. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, we'll keep in touch and we'll talk to you later. Uh, everybody stick around. We'll be right back with John Fugelsang. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's Fugelsang Fridays. That means I'm being joined by my good friend, host of the Tell Me Everything show, on Serious Progress Channel 127, which is an incredible show. It's weeknights at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. And it is also now a podcast, in case you don't subscribe to Sirius XM. So you can get that wherever you get your podcast. Please welcome John Fugelsang. Oh, Allison, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. I, I love getting to come here and drag everything down to my base level. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so glad you're here because I wanted to talk to you today about the ethics report that came out from the the uh, House Ethics Committee on our good friend, George Santos. And I was wondering what your top line thoughts were, because there was a lot of stuff in here that isn't in the federal indictments. You know, he's 23 felony federal counts against him. Right. And so they made a referral, a criminal referral to the Department of Justice for those additional findings. But also there now seems to be a groundswell of support to expel him that he's now that he's been given his due process. You'll remember Jamie Raskin and several other Democrats voted against expelling George Santos because he hadn't received any due process. And many see this as that now he has. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, I, you'll have to excuse me because I, I didn't know that using campaign funds for personal gain is the sort of thing congressmen call each other out on now. So, <laughs> you know, wow, what a shock. Um, and using it for Botox, too. So I respect that. Botox is 23 years old this year. Don't look surprised. Uh, but uh -huh. in the case of Santos, you know, I, I look, I think Democrats are nuts to let him go away. They're crazy to let this guy go. I, I agree with Congressman Raskin that he deserved his due process. I still think Al Franken deserves his. And he's had it. I mean, he committed fraud. He willfully violated the Ethics and Government Act on his financial disclosures. He knowingly had his campaign file fake reports with, with the FEC. I mean, they, they found so much more than we already knew. It's substantial. And I think you're right. There's a better chance than ever of him being removed from office. But, you know, for me, what does that lead to? I mean, the GOP has a four seat majority now in the House, and they're not going to want to lose that. So I bet you're not going to see him expelled. Um, Democrats are in a tougher place. I think I've said on your show before, Democrats should want to keep George Santos right where he is. And every day you should pick him up by his ankles and beat the Republican caucus with him because he is the face of that party. And and here, here's my thing. I think he deserves to be. I think he deserves to be the face of this Republican Congress, this doughy compost heap of festering lies. He's such an empty shell. Hermit crabs can live inside of him. But I mean, when you look at how many lies he told, that he lied about his religion, that he lied about 9-11, um, that he lied about his financing. I mean, he, he, he should lead this party. This is the party that lied about weapons of mass destruction. And they lied about being greeted as liberators. They lied about death panels that Obama wasn't born here and COVID's going to go away with the with the warm weather. So, you know, I think he deserves to be there. Uh, but we'll see how it all plays out. I think we have to remember his seat will go to a Democrat no matter what. It is Long Island and it is conservative, but it's from a district that Biden won by double digits. So either way, um, they can get rid of him, have another placeholder come in to vote R for the next year. But I'm sad to say this will be the end of his political career until he gets the inevitable show on Newsmax. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, the inevitable show on. Yeah. And whatever podcast he decides to create. But he has announced he is not running for reelection in that seat. Does that change the calculus at all for whether you keep him in or expel him? I think he's counting on that changing the calculus that they will keep him in, that it would be too much trouble and effort to go to it. Um, and I hope the Democrats can fundraise off him for another year and a half. But, you know, again, for me, like George Santos is a gay immigrant for Donald Trump. That to me is proof that there is a God and he loves us and he wants us to laugh. Gay immigrants for Trump. <laughs> and then, you know, we can talk about people not running for re-election. Manchin has announced that he is not running for re-election and told Welker on uh, Meet the Press that he is absolutely considering a run for president. What are your thoughts there? I mean, it was pretty fascinating. I don't know if you were surprised by that or not. I, I, I wasn't. He's 
doomed in the seat. He cannot hold his Senate seat. It's kind of a miracle we've kept a Democrat in office as long as possible. And I've had to say many times to my Democratic friends who want to get rid of Manchin, it's like, well, that's one fewer vote for women's reproductive rights. I mean, we can't take away from Manchin the good things he's done. Um, and I, I hope he enjoyed being president of the United States for uh, two years because he really was the most powerful yeah. in our union for a very long time. But you know, gone are the days when a Jay Rockefeller could comfortably be a Democrat from the great state of West Virginia. It's just never going to happen again. Manchin is a guy who is responsible for so many of the problems we see in our government right now. He takes in millions and millions from high corporate donors, but there are no billionaires in the state of West Virginia. All of his money comes from out of state. And and we know this. We know exactly what he's done what he and 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 cinema have done for a long time, I was saying, why can't we bribe them? Why can't we, the people, buy off Mansion and Cinema? Right, I think like let's start a GoFundMe. How much would we need to raise to get him to? I call it bribe back better. I mean, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I think we can bribe our elected officials better than lobbyists and super PACs. Um, I think he is very willing to run for president and get uh, Donald Trump elected, and I think there's going to be a lot of money thrown at him to make that happen. We are. Now in the run third party and get Donald Trump elected industrial complex. And I never thought I'd see Joe Manchin on the same team as Robert Kennedy, Cornell West. And I don't know, is Roseanne running yet? I mean, Jill it's Stein. just, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Jill, now Jill Stein's back in there again. I mean, you know, Vladimir Putin's friend, it's, there's going to be a lot of people running to try to get Donald Trump back in office. And I think at this point, the thing I like most about Joe Biden is how much evil billionaires don't like him. Yeah. And I wonder what happens when Donald Trump has to go to prison and is not the nominee. Do you think that'll happen? I mean, I don't think he's ever going to jail. And I think he will have no trouble being the nominee. I think any convictions he has, and he will have convictions, but they'll be on appeal by this time next year. I mean, the RNC is going to be in August and they are going to nominate a convicted felon to be president. It's it's going to happen. For a long time, Allison, I've 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 said, well, I think there's going to be a contested convention, and they'll probably throw in Glenn Youngkin then, and he'll be Can't the squeaky. Can't do that now. Can't do it now. <laughs> God bless the voters of Virginia. God bless an off off year election. Glenn Youngkin, as the great beige hope, is finished. So I mean, I I, I kind of feel like you know Biden could beat Ron DeSantis. Biden could beat Nikki Haley, and we know Biden can beat Trump. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of people are like, I, I hope Trump is is the nominee. But then when you think about these third party considerations um, and I personally don't think that. Well, I think that Jack Smith is going to argue against him being out uh, on, you know, pending appeal like Bannon is right now for his misdemeanor. Uh, but, you know, we'll see what ends up happening. A lot can change in a political landscape in six months, eight months, a year, as you know. I don't I don't see Trump being a Bobby Sands figure like like in the IRA actually running for office from behind bars, mainly because Bobby Sands did a hunger strike. And I don't think Donald Trump could do. A, I mean, maybe a couple of hours he could he could maybe uh, do a hunger strike. But by five o'clock, he'd need more Big Macs <laughs> or another taco bowl exactly. that Mexico pays for. Um, and moving on to uh, some other folks in the ruckus caucus, Tuberville, again, blocking military promotions. Um, and uh, incensing some Republicans, but uh, bringing some along. Mike Lee was helping him, uh, helping Tuberville block these things. But Lindsey Graham went on the floor and said, if you bring forth a rules change resolution that will allow these folks to be uh, promoted and block, I will vote for it. Although Mitch McConnell has said he's against it. We do have a resolution that came out of the Rules Committee, nine to seven along party line votes, to change the rules, basically, to allow these promotions to go forward. Uh, we don't know where that um, will end up, but I think that there may be enough Republican senators to get to the 60 vote threshold, even though McConnell opposes it. But maybe not. What are your thoughts? I mean, this comes back to the fact that Republicans abortion ban is still the most unpopular thing in this country. Cannibals on bath salts, I think, are polling better than the Republican abortion bans. And, and that's what it's all about. I'm, I'm going to say it every time. This business, this theater, I don't even want to call it theater because theater creates jobs. This performative putsch by Tommy Tuberville, who doesn't live in Alabama, this is his contempt for women in the armed forces. That's all it is. This is just saying that women who volunteer to serve our country and risk their lives 
do not have the right to not be pregnant if they don't want to be. That's it. So it, it all comes down to oppression of women. And these are the same people 20 years ago who said letting gay troops serve would compromise military readiness. And now they are deliberately, systemically compromising military readiness. Ordinarily, I'd say let them do it. The Democrats can fundraise off this and run off this. But I, th this is handing a gift wrap package, Allison, to the Democrats. And I don't know if they're going to be able to do anything with it. I mean, it destroys yet again the argument that the GOP really cares about our armed forces. They don't. They care about power. They care about votes. They care about getting donations. They care about staying in office. I mean, Donald Trump is the greatest proof we've had of Republican contempt for the armed forces. Um, you know, Tuberville's going to do this. It serves him. And that's yeah. it. It doesn't protect any fetuses, doesn't make our troops safer, doesn't help the armed forces. It just makes Tommy Tuberville look more grand to a dwindling slice of white right wing America. Yeah. And Republicans would love nothing more to continue to show that democracy is broken by breaking it. Right. And uh, by threatening national security, they would love it if we were victim of a terrorist attack while our military is compromised. Um, as much as it pains me to say it, most Republicans, I think, see it that way because they could pin it on Biden, despite any American lives lost or any terror. You mean you mean like like if Republicans, let's say, I don't know, voted to kill embassy security <laughs> and then we were attacked at the consulate in Benghazi and Republicans blamed Susan Rice for months. And then when that failed, they blamed Barack Obama for a year. And then when that failed, they blamed Hillary Clinton for two years and never once blamed the goddamn terrorists. Yeah, it sounds like some Republicans I know. Yeah, they it, they kind of have a history of doing that. And then finally, before I let you go, there was a, a, a march on Washington and Pastor Hagee, Hagee, I don't even know how you say his name, was an odd guest at that um, at that particular march. Talk about your thoughts on that. I mean, you know, look, I, let, let's go to the third rail. I, I, I will say that uh, I think the people of Israel deserve better leadership. The people of Palestine deserve better leadership. The people of Israel deserve to live in peace and security with a neighbor that recognizes their right to exist. And the people of Palestine deserve to live in freedom with control of their own borders. So we've established all that. So so uh, tens of thousands of people came to D.C., as you know, this week for the March for Israel rally. And it, it kind of gave me pause, Allison, because the March for Israel rally was for two reasons, to support Israel and to stand against anti-Semitism. OK, and, you know, and, to, and so people could chant no ceasefire and to oppose calls for a ceasefire and all that. Many speakers throughout the day, relatives of the hostages, Congress members of both parties. Speaker Johnson was there. Hakeem Jeffries spoke. Chuck Schumer spoke. Richie Torres, Joni Ernst. And uh, apparently they, they booked, unbeknownst to many Democrats, uh, John Hagee, pastor, TV evangelist, and he's the chair of Christians United for Israel. This was the guy who was the spiritual advisor to McCain in 2008, who McCain had to denounce. This is a man who once blamed Jews for the Holocaust. He said that God sent Hitler to help Jews reach the promised land. He's a big fan of Benjamin Netanyahu, um, and and he's made many anti-Catholic remarks as well. Hates the gays, I'm sure you've heard. And he showed up and he he got a lot of cheers. He said, there's no middle ground in this conflict. You're either for Jewish people or you're not. But when you look at this guy's history, Pastor Hagee said that Hitler was a half-breed Jew. He said that Israel was the only home God ever intended the Jewish people to have. That's going to be a surprise to a lot of Jews who like living here or else elsewhere. Uh, this person was on stage at a rally for Israel and against anti-Semitism. The guy who said God sent Adolf Hitler to help Jews reach the promised land. He called America the new Sodom and Gomorrah. After same-sex marriage, he said Hurricane Katrina was God's punishment against New Orleans. He's just an evil, awful, revoltingly fake Christian guy with the trans people, you name it. And yet he's allowed to speak on this stage. Hakeem Jeffries and Senator Schumer are sharing a stage with this guy. J Street, which is a liberal Jewish organization, said a dangerous bigot like Hagee should not be welcomed anywhere in our community, period. But but here's why he was there. He cares a lot about Israel. But he doesn't care about Jews because so many of our right wing Christian loved ones, they believe that Israel is necessary to bring about the end of the world. And then the Jews can be eternally damned and Jesus will return. This is all this end times shit. 
that has nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus. It's like Bible fan fiction in the Bible, that at some point the Antichrist arrives, Jesus and the dead people rise, the rapture ensues, people are lifted into the sky. None of this is in the Bible, by the way. The word rapture never appears in the Bible, but everyone left behind has these years of tribulation and disaster. And so when he hails Jews as the chosen people, he says it because he thinks that these Jews have to suffer and die or convert to Christianity. He represents the type of Christianity that thinks we have to save Israel so Armageddon can happen and Jews will die or convert to Christianity when Jesus raptures the church. And so I, I think it's really important to distinguish that he proved, just like you can be against Netanyahu and still be for Israel, you can be against Hamas and still be for Palestine, you can be for Israel and still be against the Jews. And that's exactly what this guy represented. And I don't really understand how these Democrats are looking themselves in the mirror right now. Uh, I mean, he's the poster boy for Christians who think Jews have to move back to Israel so the apocalypse can finally start. I, I, I just, I would not be seen on the same stage as this goddamn anti-Semitic ghoul. Mm, it makes me wonder if they knew. I, he, they came on like an hour after him. And so, I mean, I guess they decided that the rewards were greater than the risk. Hmm. Well. Good times. I, I mean, that's, and that's, that's what's driving all of this Mike Pence-ism, Allison. We've talked about it before. Right. They, they, they believe, they don't believe anything Jesus actually says. And Jesus says time and time again in the Bible, you will not know the hour nor the day when this happens. But they don't care. The spiritual narcissism is why they know they're going behind God's velvet rope. So they need Israel to be destroyed. And again, this is why you don't put conservative religious people in charge of governments. We're seeing it in Palestine. We're seeing it in Israel. And we've seen it here plenty of times. Putting right-wing religious people in charge of governments always leads to the opposite of what those religions taught in the first place. Oh, well said, my friend. Well said. I appreciate you joining me today, and uh, I encourage everybody to listen to Tell Me Everything on Sirius Progress XM Channel 127, weeknights at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, or the John Fuglesang podcast, which is really incredible, free wherever you get your podcasts. I really appreciate your time today. We'll see you next Friday. I'll bring a lot of dirty jokes next week, Allison. Thanks for letting me be preachy this week. <laughs> Love it. We'll talk to you then. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good news. Everybody, welcome back. It is time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good news, good news. I love the good news on Fridays. Everybody send in your good news, whether you have confessions, corrections, if you want to play what the whatever, I mean, what the mutt, what the hell is in that shell, or just what the shell, um, cat me if you can, opine on the bovine, what the heck wine, I mean, we have, whatever, send us an animal, we'll guess. <laughs> we'll guess <who> it is. <laughs> you have a shout out for a loved one, a small business in your area, your small business, uh, if shit kids say, shit you say, if you can't pay pod pet tax, you can send us an adoptable pet in your area. I love the dissertation and theses titles, you can keep sending those, whoopee stories, blankie stories, stuffed animal stories, anything at all you want to send us. Do it at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. All right, first up from Anonymous. Hello, lovely ladies, longtime listener, first time caller. Thank you for being a wonderful source of information through all these years. I want to share I landed a new job and uh, ask your input for what the mutt on my big baby of a nine month puppy, Chalupa. My <laughs> nomad friend rescued him and, and his brother earlier this year, and we both don't know what kind of dogs they are other than the best Aww. boys ever. They are very cute. Well, congrats on the new job. This is an adorable dog. There's They're... some healer. Now that that puppy has grown up a little bit, there's healer in the nose. Ridgeback, maybe? Pity. It it's looks like there's some pity. Big baby. I know. Beautiful baby. The goodest boys. That's what breed they are. <laughs> I love it. All right. This is from old Doc Rich. Pronoun she and her. You are great. In the ominous rhetoric episode, AG, you referred to Susan, oh, maybe it's Suzanne Craig. Is it Susan Craig? You would know because it's the um, Trump finance, the Pulitzer, that won the Pulitzer. Is it Suzanne or Susan? Uh, I think it's Suzanne. Okay, great, because otherwise there was going to be a correction. You referred to Suzanne Craig, who won the Pulitzer for Trump's financial reporting at the New York Times, as Anne Craig. Now, you probably just ate the beginning of her name, and I just wanted to make sure her name got out there correctly. So maybe I wasn't the right person to read this story. You are great. 
Here's a picture of a very good dog. Look at a good puppy. Yeah, Suzanne Craig. I, yes, I must thank have just you. eaten the first part of that name. You're right. Look, got the tennis ball ready to go. Yep, ready to go. Adorbs. Thank you for that, old Doc Rich. Next up from Anonymous, no pronouns. I graduated from Presbyterian College, a small liberal arts college in upstate South Carolina known as the Blue Hose. We even won a weird mascot contest during March Madness a few years ago. The long-running joke is, what the hell is a blue hose? Well, ESPN had a hilarious and hopefully unintentional answer. They spelled it hose, (laughs) H-O-E-S. Here's the official answer. The nickname blue hose began in the early 1900s when sports writers referred to the Presbyterian College athletic team as the blue stockings. Ah, because of the blue socks they wore. Writers used the term stockings and hose interchangeably over the years. The blue hose. But I love that ESPN called it the hose hose. That's very <laughs> fantastic, especially for a Presbyterian college. Um, yeah, I remember when uh, Scottsdale Community College near where I grew up had a they wanted to have a new mascot and new colors in the 60s, in the late 60s. So they they had entries, you know, okay. and people got to vote. And remember, like Bodie McBoatface, uh, this it's kind of what happened because their <laughs> their colors are hot pink and green. And their mascot is the artichoke. So, and it's still to this day, the Scottsdale Community College. So good. Yep. Love it. Thank you so much for that uh, entry. Absolutely. This one's from Christy. No pronouns on this one. Hi, Beans Queens. I've been listening since the beginning days of MSW. I enjoy the good news and all the wonderful pod pet tax photos every day. I think, hmm, I should write in and share. So here I am. I wanted to let the listeners know that every breed of dog has a rescue organization. So if someone's looking for a specific breed, there's a rescue for that breed. The rescue I adopted my baby from is Nationwide Rescue Organization and rescues from any shelter off the streets and abandoned or dumped uh, melanoise. Now, also, I urge people to learn about the breeds. Not all breeds will work in everyone's home. I adopted a Belgian melanoise and she is a handful, but I knew... I knew this before I adopted her. Now we are out twice a day playing ball or going out for runs and training continually. She's a sweetheart. And at a year and a half and five homes later, she has found her forever home. As my kids, excuse me, as my adult kids say, she is my favorite child. (laughs) Here are photos after our 630 AM run. Keep up the good work and thanks. Oh, this dog is gorgeous. Beautiful Malinois. And yeah, you're Chris- so right, Christy. Every single breed has a national and nationwide rescue. So, um, And yeah, every dog is different. Um, and and uh, some dogs might not be good for you. The Ma- like Malinois, German Shepherd dogs, you got it. They need jobs. If they don't have jobs, they will destroy your home. And, you know, you got you to make sure that you're always out with them. That's why, hence the 6.30 a.m. run and all the, you know, going out to play ball. She's beautiful. Mm. Gorgeous, so. gorgeous. All right, next up from Diane, pronoun she and her. Hello, lovely ladies. I have a mom brag for you. Oh, excellent. Tonight, my daughter was included in her, in, in do, uh, excuse me. Tonight, included, induced, no, inducted. Inducted. Into her school's National Beta Club. To be invited to join, she had to make excellent grades, demonstrate good character, and show leadership potential. She talked about friends wanting to be part of it, but never mentioned it or seemed to consider it for herself until she was invited to join. She's very proud of herself, as she should be, and so are her father and I, of course. Big brother, too. Just this school year alone, she has joined her school student government, as well as demonstrated leadership on the soccer field. She's growing into quite an impressive young woman, and I can't wait to see what impact she has on the world around her. Here she is with her brother at her ceremony. Hubby and I make good-looking kids, but stopped before we got to, stopped before we got an ugly one. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. We love them no matter what. Two is plenty. The last picture is my girl kicking butt as a goalie. Ah, goaltenders are the best. Thanks for all yeah. you do. Keep it up. Lots of love and appreciation to you both. Look at these beautiful kids. They are beautiful, and I was a keeper, a goalie for a very long time. Yep, and you aren't kidding. Good-looking kids. Glad you stopped too, Diane. Adorable. 
That's a brilliant, that's a pun right there. All right. This one's from Lori, pronouns she and her. Hello, Beans Queens. I'd like to send a double shout out to my friend Swan and President Joe Biden. Swan, her wife, an adorable three-year-old, they live in rural North Georgia, where they have a farm and small business called Harry Farm Pit Girls, <laughs> selling goat milk soap and other skincare products made with the help of their well-loved and cleverly named goats. Swan is a fantastic storyteller and shares life on the farm with a young kiddo on social media where such phrases as screaming into buttholes go viral and end up on t-shirts. Nice. Being an LGBTQIA family in the rural South can be challenging. And running an internet-based business with crappy satellite service was very difficult. Now, earlier this year, as a result of the bipartisan infrastructure law, thanks Joe Biden, rural broadband was set up in her county. So now she can operate her business and do simple things like watching TV like the rest of us. Amazing. That is amazing. I don't think people realize how hard it is to just be in our society if you don't have broadband in your area because of the way our society is set up. Yeah. And I don't think yeah. people realize just what an impact the um, bipartisan infrastructure law and the um, Inflation Reduction Act are having yeah. on families. Yep. Here's a really good example. Swan has been an amazing friend of almost 20 years and is hands down the most creative, imaginative, and hilarious person I know. She also makes amazing soap and lotions. So if you'd like to check her out, links to her website and social media are below. For pet tax, I've included some photos from the farm. Oh my God, I saw these earlier. They're amazing. First is <laughs> Vincent Van Goat, not doing the thing he is most famous for. If you know Billy Goats, you could probably guess. The second photo is David Asselhoff. <laughs> Amazing. Butch Assidy and Jacqueline Oasis, not pictured, mama ass. And lastly, <laughs> Ba Aretha Franklin. All right, we'll include the links to the description. And the website is Harry Farm Pits Girls, just like it sounds. H-A-I-R-Y-F-A-R-M-P-I-T. G-I-R-L-S, harryfarmpitgirls.com. On Facebook, it's the same thing, Harry Farm Pit Girls. Instagram is at Harry Farm Pit Girls. So go get some goat milk lotion and soaps from this incredible family, Swan and her family out there on the Oh my God. I know. Vincent Van Gogh. And then look at the look at the donkeys. David Asselhoff, Butch Assidy, and Jacqueline. Oh, yeah. Mama Ass. Not a picture. I love this. So so much. I should say Swan and the family, because I don't know Swan's pronouns from the story. So I just wanted to correct myself right away. These photos, the three donkeys are definitely my favorite. <laughs> Brilliant names. So good. Oh, thank you for sending that in. I love that shout out. That was a great one. And thanks to everybody for all your contributions. Friday good news is always Ah, it's just uh, it's just a wonderful thing. Uh, I'm going to rest this weekend. I'm a little bit under the weather. On uh, Monday night, I went out to the, my local pub and tavern that I started working at in like over 20 years ago um, as, is closing. It's um, changing ownership and the new owners are stupid. So uh, we had a one final night there. I mean, there was like 200 people in a place meant for 50 and um we're all now we're we have a like a facebook group and everyone's like i'm sick are you sick yeah i'm sick oh boy <laughs> I'm God sick. uh it's not coronavirus i tested it's not coronavirus um but yeah figures the one time i go out right so uh i'm gonna take care of myself rest a little bit this weekend but Please don't do. don't worry you will get an episode of jack on sunday you will get the weekly wrap-up for beans for patrons um, and uh, there will be a, a cleanup on L45 bonus with a bunch of swears from Pete Strzok. All of that will come your way. And uh, that's that's all I have for this week. It's been a hell of a week. Do you have any final thoughts before we close it down? No, no final thoughts. Just take it away. All right, everybody. Until we'll be back in your ears Monday. You be, Are you traveling or you'll be here Monday? I'll be here Monday. Yay. I'll be right. back from Boston. Yeah. Well, we'll be back in your ears Monday. Until then, please take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Take care of your family. Vote blue over Q. And take everyone you know with you. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants, and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. <laughs>